we're going to run out of fossil fuels or they will destroy the world or both. And the only way out of that is a complete greening of the energy system and the entire industrial system. And we will do it. And we're lucky in that the technology has made magnificent head start, much faster and further than people imagined 20 years ago. So it now is cheaper. We're going to have plenty of cheap green energy. The problem is when and how, how much damage will be done before we green the economy. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Jeremy Grantham. Jeremy is a co-founder of Grantham Mail and Van Waterloo, or GMO, a global investment management firm based in Boston. Today he serves as a member of GMO's asset allocation team serving as the firm's long-term investment strategist. He is a member of the GMO Board of Directors and has also served on the investment boards of several nonprofit organizations. Prior to GMO's founding, Jeremy was co-founder of Battery March Financial Management, where he recommended commercial indexing in 1971, one of several claims to being first. Jeremy is also a committed environmentalist and philanthropist. He founded the Grantham Foundation for the Protection of the Environment in 1997 and the Jeremy and Hanelore Grantham Environmental Trust, a public charity in 2005, both of which focus on reducing and reversing global environmental degradation. Jeremy was elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2015, was appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2016, and received with his wife, Hannah Lohr, the Carnegie Medal for Philanthropy in 2017, all for leadership in climate change activities. In 2017, the Grantham Trust launched an environmental venture capital strategy, Neglected Climate Opportunities, LLC, to nurture environmental innovation in early stage technologies and businesses. Jeremy, I've admired you for years. You've been an innovative pioneer in finance, building GMO to one of the very best asset managers in the world. You've also sounded an early and urgent alarm on the climate change threat and have been an advocate for the need to reform capitalism. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. But let's start at the beginning. You were born, spent your early years in the United Kingdom. Tell us a bit about your early life there. Well, I was born just before the war. My father volunteered, was a civil engineer, went off to build bridges. He joined up when World War II broke out when I was one year old. Right. And uh, so I never, I never met him. And after two or three years in Egypt, building bridges, airports, he died of diseases. And our family moved from near London up to a the north in a coal mining town and lived with my mother's parents who had been very working class and had made good, had opened a corner store and turned it into 17, sold it for a, a fairly large restaurant in the middle of town on what was called the Great North Road that linked London to Edinburgh and on which I watched the invasion forces traveling south before uh, D-Day thousands of tanks and trailers and Canadians and New Zealanders and Poles and Czechs and everybody on, on the planet. And, and we used to accost the uh, Americans, only the Americans, and ask them if they had any gum. Got any gum chum, we would say. They always gave you uh, something. The mean ones gave you one strip of Wrigley's gum and the generous ones gave you a whole packet. Tell me a bit about your education. I, I was a terrible student, probably had attention deficit disorder when I look back. But in any case, we were encouraged to be a sportsman. I was a very good sportsman and a very bad student. And um, we have these infamous A-levels in England that make or break you at uh, the end of high school. And I managed to uh, be broken in the sense that I failed two out of the three that I'd taken. And uh, with a bit of help, I scrambled into a retake 
factory in London. I'd been at a, a boarding school from eight to 18. And at 19, I did a crammer in London to try and make up my lost ground. I managed to scramble into one university. I put in my data and the computer spun and uh, Sheffield University offered to have me. So I didn't have to visit it. I just got on the train and went off to college. And I signed up to do English and uh, found myself competing with all the bright women in England, it seemed. After a semester or two, I transferred to economics, which seemed uh, at the time a lot easier and was. And the competition was more reasonable. And I finally woke up intellectually and did pretty well. And that helped me eventually get into uh, Harvard Business School. So why Harvard Business School? What brought you to the United States? Well, Harvard Business School was a cliche. It was the only business school we heard of anywhere in the world. We had no idea that there were 40 or 50 in America. And uh, I went to apply for a job to a toffee-nosed consulting firm, management consulting. And they patronized me in the then typical upper-class way and said, come back and see us when you've had, you know, 40 years of variegated experience or you've been to the Harvard Business School. And I stood there on the sidewalk outside their offices and trying to decide whether I should burn the office down or apply to Harvard Business School. <laughs> so, so I did the latter. And by a series of miraculous pieces of good luck, I found myself eventually sitting in the amphitheater at Cambridge. And so now to talk a little bit about your experience at Harvard Business School, because when you graduated from business school, did you aspire to be an entrepreneur and build your own investment firm? Sort of how did you go from Harvard Business School to your career in finance? Quite a lot of us foreigners saw the experience as a kind of time out to think about life. What are you going to do with your life? Meet a few strangers expand your horizons. We were much more renaissance about it than the Americans. And uh, so I had no great ambitions, no targets. I just followed my nose. I put a lot of time and energy into the courses that were entertaining, interesting, and tried to avoid and do as little as possible uh, to the ones I didn't like. Uh, that guarantees you will not be a Baker scholar. I can give you that. And uh, we had some really interesting classes. And it um, nudged me into a greater interest in, in the stock market. But punting for time, I signed up as a general management consultant and um, quickly realized it was a disaster. Asked where my friends were having an exciting time. And, and by a huge margin, that was the stock market. Back in 1966, seven, eight, nine, there was a very nice little bubble in tiny stocks that made for a lot of excitement. And so I fairly assiduously looked for a job and uh, the best job came in uh, Boston. I had moved for 18 months down to Manhattan and fairly cheerfully moved back to Boston. So anyway, you found your way to investing. And you know, I can remember back to the days when I was at Goldman Sachs and we really admired Grantham Mayo because it was so analytic, data-driven. In fact, you may remember, we admired it so much that we tried to acquire the firm, but you weren't selling. So to talk a bit about GMO, what did it take to build it? And what lessons do you have for entrepreneurs? Or talk about a little bit about how you went from Battery March to GMO. I went to um, Battery March because I saw an opportunity. I have become very interested in, in small cap and small cap didn't really exist as a category and people were into the nifty 50, the 50 giant Coca-Colas. They had no time for small cap and being a natural contrarian, I began to think, wouldn't it be neat to start a company that specialized in small cap and value? So I propositioned one of the fund managers, uh, Dean LeBaron, and he said he would, he said he wouldn't, he said he would. And in the end, he did. And um, he set off with me and uh, we looked around for office space and so on and threw ourselves into business. We had no business to manage. We hoped that it would be the path to our door. And it was very slow to do that. After four or five painful years in 1975, 
uh, we had about 50 million <laughs> under management. So we were pretty well starving. And then finally, the small cap, of course, turned spectacularly. They rang the bell, I like to say, January the 1st, 1975. And our little stocks that everyone had disdained came charging out and kept going year after year after year. And we were able to win there for a minute or two by double digit alphas for two or three, four years in a row. And that attracted, of course, all the money you could shake a stick at. Fell out with the boss. And so um, most of us left. Dick Mayo had been with us at Keystone Mutual Funds and uh, came a bit later to join us at Battery March. So he and I were the portfolio managers when we left and uh, we took some of the back office and the technical help and so on. And we set up shop in the same building, the same Battery March building on Battery March Street to irritate them, no doubt. And we set out above all to try and outperform Battery March to prove that we had been the engine room, that in fact we had been. And that worked out pretty well. Small caps did extremely well. And they were easy to beat in those days. There wasn't a lot of talent in the investing business. If you tried hard, you did a good analytical job, you called every company. And the small cap people were pleased to talk to us. No one was talking to them. So we would call up and chat with the boss, with the CEO of these little firms. And the fact that we were a small firm didn't stop it. They were very happy to talk to us. So we had what by many standards would pass as inside information. They told us what was happening. No one else knew because they hadn't called. And so we bought the stock and it turned out to be accurate. And it was indeed cheap. And we outperformed. Of the eight years, we won seven by an average of all eight years of six points a year. So that was, that was neat. And then falling out with the boss and wanting a little more flexibility to do what we wanted and perhaps a little more credit, we uh, set up GMO. And we propositioned uh, Van Otterlo, who'd been also with us at Keystone Funds a few years earlier. And, um, and we were in business. Again, we had no, no business to start with. We waited to see what would happen. And a consulting firm, Cambridge Associates, bumped into us and started to recommend us. And the first year went brilliantly well. The uh, stock picking account that Dick Mayo and I ran uh, won the first nine years in a row by eight points a year. But if you're going to start a new firm, I recommend that as a way to start. Since then, I've had plenty of down legs, but uh, you wouldn't want to start a new firm with a down leg, and we did. Any other lessons for entrepreneurs? Because it, it sure seemed to me it must have been in your blood. Going back to the beginning, you know, four, four years to get 15 million under management. So it, it takes a lot of persistence. Yeah. And uh, you had to feel that you were all in, that you were willing to risk all the money you had accumulated. Every penny we had made at Battery March, and he bought me out at two and a half times earnings on an income stream that was doubling every six months. So you couldn't say any, anything other than that we were ripped off. But we took what money we could get our hands on, and, and every penny of it was at risk in starting GMO. We wanted to feel that we could do up to four years with very little business without quitting. So we started with the insight that you needed to be uh, determined, and we were ready to, to last. As it turned out, we broke even in two years, and by the end of year four, we were making a perfectly handsome profit. Jeremy, now let's talk about today. This is a very difficult time to be in the markets. Inflation is higher than it's been in 40 years. Interest rates rising. Stocks have been falling sharply. Help our listeners make sense of what's going on and what you think is coming next. So in the interest of full disclosure, I do not do full court strategy. I stopped doing that 15 years ago. I thought when I was 67, it was plenty of time to let my colleagues make all their own mistakes. In, that, in the last 15 years, I have just focused on a handful of very big picture items and uh, left all the portfolio management uh, to my colleagues. I, I do not interfere. Okay, having said that, my big picture issues have included resources, potentially running out of resources, climate change, 
and all that that might mean for several decades into the future. And stock market bubbles, which I have followed really for 50 years, initially kind of as a hobby, as a specialty, and later as an important kind of part of the business. I think the forming and breaking of the great bubbles are really the only thing that really matters in uh, equity management. Rest of the time, show up, keep your nose clean, make a point or two, lose a point or two. It doesn't really matter. But once in a blue moon, typically every 20 years, but more recently, a, a little more frequently than that, you have these bubbles. They form over a number of years, they dominate everything, and then they break. And once again, they dominate everything. It, it really does matter. And if you can bring yourself to sidestep some of the pain, it can make a lot of difference. I don't think the bubbles are hard to spot, but that is my specialty. I look at the handful of real McCoy bubbles, the type that have really crazy investor behavior, that have masses of enthusiasm, and they stand out like a sore thumb. 1929, the 2000 tech bubble, the 2007 housing bubble in the US, Japan in 1989, both land and housing and the stock market, probably the biggest bubbles of both the equity market and the real estate market in the history of man. So they are the real McCoy. And then there's an interesting almost case of 1972, the Nifty 50. It didn't go quite as high. It wasn't quite as silly, but it was on the cusp of oil crises and so on, so that it went down a whole lot. It went down every bit as much as some of the others. A 62% decline adjusted for inflation in 1973-74, still the biggest decline since the 1930s. So that's my universe. And, and here we are. We have checked off all of the indicators that are unique to those handful of events. Crazy behavior, check, check. The Bitcoins of the world and the cryptocurrencies, the meme stocks of the AMC uh, GameStop variety. I could even add my quantum scape. And uh, very rapid acceleration the prior year in uh, 2020, where the NASDAQ more than doubled in the year. And even from the beginning, pre-COVID was up almost 60%. Up almost 60% despite a huge wipeout from COVID. So rapid acceleration is a characteristic you have to see. Crazy behavior, you have to see. And then there is a unique and special case. And that is on the upside, and that's important, on the upside, the blue chips start to win. And the stocks with very high volatility that normally go up one and a half or two times the blue chips, they don't even get the sign right and they start to go down. 1929, the specs, the really crazy stocks went down all year. Little known fact, but they did. The day before the crash, they were down 30% as an index. Nothing like that happened again until 1972. 1972, in the Nifty 50, the S&P went up 17, and the average big board stock went down 17, so that I could remember it forever, symmetry. Nothing like that happened again until 2000. And then in 2000, in the tech bubble, the dot-coms peeled off in March and really collapsed. And then through the summer, the junior growth, the medium growth, and then finally the senior growth all peeled off. And by the early fall, most of them were down 50%, and some of the dot-coms were down a lot more, but the S&P was unchanged, which meant that the 70% that was not growth had gone up 18%. So the S&P blue chips had gone up 18, and the growth and the NASDAQ and the dot-coms had taken a very big hit. That is absolutely classic. Now, starting early last year, one by one, the various most speculative groups that had done brilliantly in 2020 started to do badly. And the first was my QuantumScape. QuantumScape is a brilliant research outfit that came public in a SPAC in December 2020. And very quickly it ran up to from 10 to 133. At 133, it was worth 55 billion more than General Motors making a solid state battery. 
it was worth more than Panasonic, if you want to talk batteries. And then it started to decline. And by the summer of 21, when I was allowed to sell it after six months, it was 25. So it was already down. You work it out a whole lot, 75%. And today it's 11. These great bubbles have nothing to do, very, very little to do with the underlying reality. So as these last two years have gone by, it has reported faithfully all the good progress it's been making. And yet the stock comes down from 133, you know, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, down to 11. It's still hitting its targets in terms of research. It still has three years to wait, however, before it has any sales. And that is just the kind of stock that will continue to be weak, if I'm right. Anyway, uh, that led the parade that started in 2020, December. And then the meme stock started March, April, and um, Bitcoin, April, May, June, and so on. And then one by one, most of the advanced techie stocks started to come down. And ARK um, peaked out a couple of months later and has, of course, declined 75%. ARK is a whole portfolio of 25 growth stocks that often have no earnings, but but do have, at least in the portfolio managers, a belief, huge prospects. But they, that kind of stock is very vulnerable to a loss of confidence. And therefore, it started the decline pretty early and continues today right into the teeth of the seller. So this market has been proceeding eerily like 2000. And I think phase one, superficially, you have a 2000 tech bubble, horribly overpriced, much too much enthusiasm, huge buy-in by individuals, fueled by a massive program of cash distribution associated with COVID bailout. A lot of that found its way into the stock market. So this was sensational. So that's phase one. Phase two, which I really worry about, is this whole thing morphing into what I call the 1970s. Underlying inflation as an everyday topic once again. It may not be spiking in the 70s. It came and went, came and went, came. It was always part of the back, background discussion. And uh, that's what I think it will be now for quite a long time, several years. And similarly, interest rates were always a worry in the 1970s, and they will be a worry for quite a few years to come. Beyond that, longer term, I worry that we are fairly deep into running out of the cheapest most available resources. I think that turning point was 2002. Between 1900 and 2002, the average important commodity came down 70% in real price adjusted for inflation. And we keep our own index at GMO, 36 most important equal weighted commodities. This is not dominated by oil. This is looking at the breadth of what is happening to commodities. And then if you look at that again today, it is not down 70%, it's down 10% since 1900, a rounding error. So it's gone from down 70 or 30 on an index basis to 90. It has tripled since 2002. The average important commodity has tripled in real terms since 2002. And uh, I think this is an important problem going forward. We haven't done any CapEx. There are no great reserves of copper, lithium, cobalt, nickel, et cetera, waiting to crush onto the market. And yet we need them to green the economy. We're simply going to run light of these metals. We need technology to design a way around them. New batteries that don't use so much, recycling techniques to save what we have, et cetera, et cetera. Many of these things we invest in, in the Grantham Foundation. I want to talk about Jeremy Grantham, the environmentalist, beginning with climate change. Of course, the world needs to transition away from coal-fired electric power generation as soon as possible. But you can remember back to the early days in England, where coal was burned in furnaces to heat people's homes, and the smog was sometimes so thick it was hard to see. I remember hearing you tell those stories. This was a even more immediate and acute challenge, wasn't it? So take us back to London in the days of the smog, and then we'll get to uh, climate change today. First of all, we didn't have furnaces. We just 
threw the coal on the fireplace and did our best to light it. And if you were a fat cat, you had a gas poker uh, to help you light it. And if you weren't, then you had paper and twigs and, and you became pretty clever at it. But of course, the air in the cities, the towns, and of course, London above all, was utterly pernicious with coal smoke. We had these pea supers that A, killed you if you had a weak chest or you were old and decrepit and made everybody, even the very young and healthy, quite sick. Encouraged Churchill then to take drastic action and start to make a coal-free zones of London. And that's all you had to do uh, to get rid of those great smogs. I caught the last one when I was a young traveling salesman just out of college, working for my stepfather, hospital supply company. You could not see two paces. Whether it was daylight or nighttime didn't make any difference. Your headlights just gave you a yellow color to the fog. It didn't illuminate anything. And my car was out, so I had to get it home, fortunately only a mile or two. And I had to proceed sitting in the passenger seat with the door open so I could see the curb and stretching my legs over to keep the car moving forward moving so slowly that if there was a car parked there, I could bump it gently. And it took me about an hour and a half to do a mile or so and finally made it. But they were impossible. You had to stop your car, you could not drive. And the street lights came on in the middle of the day and, and a few people were seriously disturbed about the end of the world uh, on the last one that I was in. Wow. So we've come a ways since those days, but we still got a huge, huge challenge in front of us. So let's talk about the present. You're in full climate mitigation mode, combining your philanthropy and investing uh, capabilities to accelerate the transition to a low carbon world. Jeremy, you spent your life looking at risk. How do you calibrate this one? How big is this climate challenge? It's not only the biggest risk. If you look back at World War II even, once America was in the war with its resources and once Germany had attacked Russia, in a sense, it couldn't win. It might have been able to negotiate a kind of draw. In that sense, World War II was not that risky for the US. This this is much riskier. At risk here is the stability of the entire global system that we have come to, you know, accept and and quite like, I think, for the last 80 years. And we've muddled along, there have been little local wars, but there's been a big increase in prosperity. Quite a few countries like China have joined in the prosperity. It's been quite a remarkable era. And all of that is at risk. The main risk, the thing that will cause the greatest problems is food. Food is under stress anyway without climate change. But with climate change, the heat is a problem, the extra flooding is a problem, and great downpours are the most dependable feature of climate change. Warmer air takes more water vapor, more water vapor guarantees that when it rains, it will rain harder. And if there's one thing that even a skeptic can get their brain around is that we have more heavy downpours around the world. They are all over the place, all the time. And they don't make farming easy. And in between, perversely, you have drought. And the droughts are not so much lack of rain, although there are areas that get less rain. The droughts come from the higher temperatures absorbing all of the moisture, evaporating it, and causing a dry state of affairs, very bad for farming, very bad for forest fires, as we see. And lying beyond that is this thing just beginning to dawn on people from last week when it got very hot indeed in India, and that is the wet bulb. Wet bulb is the temperature when you wrap a wet towel around a thermometer. The evaporation, if the air is dry, cools down the temperature. But if it's very humid, it can't. And what happens at 31 degrees centigrade, which is only in the high 80s, you start to suffer with high humidity. By 35 degrees centigrade, you can't function. More than six hours at 35 degrees centigrade and 95% humidity, 
your internal organs fail and you die. So you will not be able to persist in farming if you have too many days like that. The Indian subcontinent have had temperatures way over 40 degrees centigrade. The saving grace has been that it was pretty dry. And so the effect was, you know, heat stroke and pretty pernicious, but it didn't kill you. But had it been humid, had the monsoon been around, uh, people would have started already dropping dead. They never expected to see a heat wave over 40 degrees centigrade. It peaked at 50 in one city. This is way horrifically ahead of schedule. The other thing is Africa. Africa has old soil, terrible governance, great distances, and they have a trouble feeding themselves now. And they are having terrible droughts uh, year after year, including this year, as we said. And now you add to their problem a lack of fertilizer uh, coming from Russia and particularly bad weather. And we are going to find food crises all over the place with unintended consequences. But looking out 20, 30 years into the future, Africa will be doing extremely well not to have an incremental series of failing states. And the more states that fail, the more pressure they put on the remainder. And this could turn not just hundreds of thousands of potential immigrants into Europe, but potentially tens of millions trying desperately. And this will really rattle the cage politically. The right wing will make a meal out of it. And who knows what the consequences would be. We have bad actors around the world as we see in the Ukraine with Russia, an unstable situation such as this that we are likely to see with food does not bode well. The other thing we have to bear in mind is that the developed world in China is beginning to run out of people. Uh, in any developed country except Israel, we're not replacing our people, and nor is China. We're all collectively uh, having a fertility rate uh, as we sit of about 1.6, and we need 2.1 to replace. So each cohort of babies is running now about a quarter of below replacement. So if you're running out of labor, and, and we have been for quite a few years, so we know that the cohorts of 20 year olds starting now will be declining, guaranteed over the next 20 years. So you have a shortage of labor, which feels inflationary. You have a shortage of cheap, plentiful resources, metals, food, which feels inflationary. And, and you have a very tricky, complicated situation on which we could spend an hour on energy as we try and transition from uh, fossil fuels to green. And we will be lucky if that is not inflationary. It may not be, but it may be. So all in all, we face some very intractable inflationary problems that we have not faced. And I want to now pick up on something you mentioned and talk about the transition to a low carbon economy, which is essential. And it's going to take decades and it's going to be essential to develop and commercialize and roll out and scale the technologies we need to decarbonize industrial processes for making things like cement and steel. And capital is not going to come in the quantities we need unless the projects and processes are commercially viable. Investing at a loss is obviously not a sustainable strategy. So with your climate venture investing project, your fund is, Jeremy, do you see this as being very important to accelerate this transition to a, a lower carbon economy? We're going to run out of fossil fuels or they will destroy the world or both. And the only way out of that is a complete greening of the energy system and the entire industrial system. And we will do it. And we're lucky in that the technology has made magnificent head start, much faster and further than people imagined 20 years ago. So it now is cheaper to have incremental unit of solar energy or wind energy. And storage has come down to 10 cents on the dollar in a dozen years. Sadly, it needs to do that again. We're going to have plenty of cheap green energy. The problem is when and how, how much damage will be done before we green the economy. We can't move fast enough. We've already done a lot of irreversible damage. There are some items that may be slipping out of our control as we sit here, particularly the melting of the uh, Arctic and the Antarctic and the oceans rising and the effects that that have. Speed is absolutely vital. Now, the good news is US does research and new ideas, venture capital, does it very, very well. 
there's, there's this long tradition of American exceptionalism. And indeed in 1946, America was pretty well exceptional in everything. But honestly, from 1946 until today, most of the indicators that matter to me, the US has lost ground in, in almost everything that you could think, but it has not lost ground in venture capital. So in a capitalist system, which I think is rather fat and happy, monopolistic, too much power for the corporations, too many regulations, are done for their advantage by regulatory bodies that they have ba basically captured. But in that system, there stands out the VC industry. And we have a death grip on the great research universities that are so closely related to venture capital. We have something like 15 out of 20, and then there's another three of the remaining five in the UK. And that is huge. And so we have decided, if you have to depend on good common sense, doing the right thing, we're toast. If you have to depend on creativity and money-making talents, the U.S. might make it. So we are backing that. We are not putting all our money behind hoped-for altruism. We're putting all the money we can beg, borrow, and steal behind green technology. And I consider it the only have your cake and eat it of my life, which is this. I think a dollar spent in carefully selected green VC, and we only do things that if they work, they will make a terrific difference. I think they are candidates for moving the cause as fast as any dollar could, and secondly, for making more money than anyone else. And that money on several hundred of these things, many will fail, but on average, uh, we expect them to have a very high return, as they should on paper, but I think in real life with the world waking up and getting behind green and putting in green carbon taxes and green regulations, there is a real following wind uh, to green venture capital that does not exist for many other branches of venture capital. So I really think uh, this is our strong suit. And we have put uh, already almost 50% of our foundation into early stage green VC. Well, I, I tell you, I commend you because what it's going to take, because it's going to take trillions and trillions of dollars of capital, ultimately, right? And so the way forward is to show and, and to demonstrate you can make a, a lot of money by doing something where you make a big positive difference. So this is great. You and I have also, I'm going to go to another topic, have spent big portions of our lives working in the capital markets. And we believe in market-driven principles. You've been making though a strong case that capitalism needs to be updated and reformed so that we have inclusive growth that benefits more people. Why do you believe this is so important? I mean, it all comes back to Henry Ford, who was not a bleeding heart liberal, I understand, <laughs> when he says uh, to justify putting up his wage rate, that if his workers couldn't afford one of his cheap cars, who the hell could? And that's what it boils down to. It's one thing squeezing your labor for the odd five or 10 years. We've been squeezing our labor since 75. That's 25, 35, 40, 47 years. And a lot of that is not profitable in any way. They are losing the ability to be healthy, viable members of the economic society, some of them. And if you look at the growth rate of the US economy, Yes, it's had a very flashy top 10%. The FANGs are brilliant enterprises, probably a better handful of companies than we ever had at any time before in terms of their unique ability to move fast and make new ideas. But if you look down, further down the system, you find the level of new enterprises undertaken in the US is way down. The number of people in companies one or two years old is half of what it was in the 1970s as a per capita basis. We are simply not as broadly adventurous and capitalistic as we used to be. Why not? Well, for one thing, there are no capital reserves. You can't even raise enough money to start a barbershop. You ask, how much money do you have in reserve? And a third of Americans can't put together $500. You know, th this is not a healthy, healthy system that we've developed. And the growth rate of the U.S. economy has slowed more than people realize that the productivity component has slowed down from 1.8 to about 0.9 for the last 
15 years, 0.9. Now, it's still semi-dignified, but 1.8 compounds a whole lot better. And, and the problem there is you add to productivity, you add the increase in the workforce. And back in the 60s, you were adding 1.5% a year to the workforce. In the next 20 years, we'll be lucky if we only subtract 0.2%. So we've had an enormous drop of 1.7% a year in labor and maybe more. And we've had a pretty steady drop of 0.9% in productivity. So this is indicative that all is not healthy. And I think the central poison to the system is a blinding increase in inequality. And to just quote some of the cliches, 1965, your average CEO, Fortune 500, made 40 times the average worker, which seems quite a lot, really, when you think about it, 40 times the family income. And now it's 300, and it peaked higher. And that really sounds pretty obscene to me. Now, back in Japan, they were about 40 in 1965. They're about 40 today. They have no rules on that topic. This is social contract. Another thing that happens when you get more inequality, uh, our Gini ratio, which is a measure of income inequality, has moved to dead last amongst the developed world. We're now fighting it out with the Mexicos and Brazils and, and Russians. This is not right. And a high Gini ratio is strongly positively associated with the social contract. And the social contract is simply your expectation that you can depend on your neighbors and that you owe your neighbors. That's the social contract. And the Scandinavians still have it. Japan has it big and the South Koreans and the Canadians not too badly, but ours has gone to hell. Back when we were an equal society during the thirties and, and into the forties, thank heavens, we had to fight World War II when the social contract was in good shape. People really felt they owed the city, the corporations owed the city and individuals owed their country and their city and everybody owed everybody. And that's the way it should be. And it showed. And productivity was huge and, and general contentment was pretty high. And since then, the capital and the income has gravitated increasingly towards the top 10%, the top 1%, the top 0.1%. So, Jeremy, where do you come out on the need to increase the minimum wage legally? I think the biggest shock is how much lower the minimum wage is than it used to be in America as a fraction of economic income. I mean, what excuse can you say about that, that the federal minimum wage is something like a half of what it was in the 1960s adjusted for inflation? I mean, this is just crazy. And it should be also adjusted for the increased wealth of, of society. So that's the very least you can do. And yes, of course, I approve of a basic minimum living wage, 15 or $20 an hour. It is important, but to get back to the main point, you have to find a way of increasing equality once again. That takes serious attitude, a lot of people trying, quite a few years. It's moving the pendulum, which has been swinging through democratic and Republican regimes alike, has been swinging towards the rich and you have to move it back a bit. And you can do that through taxes, you can do that through incentives, you can do that through helping educate the poorer people. Education is always a killer antidote to inequality. And of course, as I view it, and I think you would agree with this, a big part of this is a political system that's addicted to money. And when you look at special interests and lobbying and you know what's happened to our regulatory system and uh, what's happened to our tax system, it really is distorted things. In every country that doesn't have a lively lobbying by the fossil fuel industry, the entire world accepts the science. Climate is the defining risk threatening us. Where does it not? Where is it a contested idea? The US and Australia in first place, co-equal, and then a gap, and then the UK, and then a gap, and then Canada. The four English-speaking oily places with big oil industry, with Shells and BPs in the case of the UK, with lots of shale oil, tar sands, I mean, in Canada, et cetera, and then a massive coal industry in Australia and a massive everything fossil fuel industries in the US. They have so effectively fought the idea 
uh, that they have muddied the science and they did it deliberately. We have minutes in their archives. We have been helping research these topics, but they knew perfectly well. They're scientists. They knew that carbon dioxide was dangerous, that water levels would rise, and they went out of their way to suppress it. Exxon used to pay for research into these things. And then one day, under a new uh, CEO, they fired all the scientists, except a couple who turned coat. They sold their research vessel, and they put their money into obfuscation, into obscuring the truth in order to delay. They have delayed us by 10 or 15 years. 10 or 15 years that may cost us more than we can afford, may cost us indeed everything. And they did it in the name of making more money. Apparently they have no grandchildren, or as I like to say, they hate the ones they have. I'm not sure what it is, but in any case, they knew that CO2 was dangerous and they paid to make it uh, an idea that that was not the case. So, Jeremy, I agree with you that uh, climate change is the ultimate generational equity issue, right? So let's conclude this interview today with what advice can you give to young people looking to start a career in today's fast-paced, increasingly complex world? So what, what advice do you give young people today? Well, don't sit back and take it on the chin. It's your life. You better fight for it and do that. And if you want an exciting career and you can get into venture capital and focus on green technologies, I would. I mean, I really think it's the most exciting and most important area of research on the planet. And if you don't do that, be a scientist. Be something truly useful at a time when the stakes are high and a few good scientists might make all the difference. Jeremy, thank you for that. This has been terrific. We've covered a lot of ground. You've covered a lot of ground today and you've given our listeners a lot to think about. So thank you. It was a real pleasure, Hank. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.